Oh, good morning, everyone. I don't know about you, but I find as we travel through the Sermon on the Mount that it's doing its work in my heart, and I hope it is in yours as well. I was driving down the road one afternoon here in Red Deer, and the announcer on the radio said, I want to play a new song for you uh, from the Sidewalk Prophets. He said, you'll really like it. And indeed I did. It was a beautiful song that um, basically expressed the prayer of the hearts of these people. A prayer that said, Lord, make me broken. Lord, make me empty. Lord, make me the man that you want me to be. And I find as I go through the Sermon on the Mount, I need that because I'm finding out that my heart is a lot harder than I thought it was and more calloused than I had hoped it would be. But the prayer when you encounter this sermon and you begin to see your heart for what it is, is, Lord, make me broken. Lord, make me empty. That's always the place where transformation begins. It's also reading this last week a biography of one of the great preachers in the United States in the 20th century. His name was Adrian Rogers. He preached in Memphis, Tennessee at a church called Bellevue Baptist Church for over 32 years. And uh, God wonderfully blessed his ministry. He went home to be with the Lord in 2005. But in that biography, he talks about how God got a hold of his heart and his life. He said, frequently as a young man, I would find myself praying, Oh God, use me. He said, one night I was walking home across a football field, and I felt a need to kneel and pray. Alone on that football field, I called out to the Lord, God, I want you to use me. Kneeling did not seem good enough or humble enough, so I laid down prostrate on the grass and said, Father, I want you to use me. That didn't seem humble enough. So I took my finger and I made a hole in the dirt and put my nose in that hole in the dirt. And I called out, Lord, I'm as low as I know how to get. I want you to use me. Well, he says, um, something happened to me that night. I didn't have ecstasies, he said, or visions, or there was any writing in the sky. But he said, it was the beginning of a transformation in my life where God began to use me. It started when he humbled himself before God. And when we're done today, I would like to have Ken and the group come out, and they're going to play the song that says, Lord, make me broken make me empty and we'll listen to it and the second time through we'll make it our prayer together it's always the place where God begins to transform a person's life is when they humble themselves before him and say Lord make me broken make me empty and then fill me with your spirit well we've come in Matthew 5 to verses uh, 33 down to about verse 37 but before we get there I want to just have a look back at what we talked about for a moment last week. I had assumed, coming into today, that we had traveled through the hard part of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Sean had two of those pieces, and last week we talked about marriage and divorce. Um, I was wrong. We actually never get out of the hard part of this Sermon on the Mount, as you'll see shortly. But I think it's worthwhile just to look back, because there's a question that's often raised, and maybe you've raised it too about this whole issue of marriage and divorce. The question is this, why are the statistics for marriage and divorce the same outside the church as they are inside? Or that's the wrong way. Why are they the same inside the church as they are outside? If you know statistics in these areas at all, you'll know that's about right. The number of divorces inside the community called um, Christ followers and out in the world are sadly very, very similar. Why? I want to suggest to you an answer. The answer is that in both cases, it's the breakdown of community. When there's a breakdown of community, there's always a breakdown of marriage and family. We know that there's a breakdown of community out there, but there is in the church as well, and that's one of the great reasons why marriages and families break down. You were never meant to do marriage alone. Did you know that? You were never meant to do it alone. Um, when you get an invitation to a wedding ceremony, they're not just asking you to come and bring a gift. You know why you get an invitation to a wedding ceremony? 
You're coming to be a witness to the vows, the promises that a couple are going to make. That's why you're invited. And as a witness to those vows, what you're saying by your presence there is, I am for you. I will do my part, whatever that means, to help you keep those vows. I will pray for you. I will encourage you. I will speak into your life when I need to. But I'm there as a witness to those vows. The next time somebody puts an invitation to a wedding in your hands, think it through. Recognize why you're there. A while back, we did a series on marriage called Springtime in Palestine, and we based it on the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon in the Old Testament. It's a love poem. And I don't know if you remember, but, but even way back then, marriage was always done in community. I mean, you have the, this refrain that runs through it. Check it out sometime. Where the friends of the bride and groom speak into their lives. They give their thoughts before they're married about what this relationship is should be like. They speak into it after their marriage, that marriage is done in community. Um, Matthew 19, what we looked at last week, where it talks about marriage and the breakdown of marriage, is uh, following, of course, Matthew 18. But in Matthew 18, you have that great unpackaging of relationships in the body of Christ when people are bold enough to stand up and say, there's something wrong there, you need to address that. Now, I want to suggest to you that if we caught a vision, a game, of what it means for marriage to be done in community, it would greatly help change some of those statistics. I think at its very basic level, what it means is this, that we'll pray for our friends and for their marriages. That we will, even as couples, when we get together, sometimes take time to pray for one another and maybe just speak into each other's lives. Or... Maybe it's as simple as making it a priority to have fellowship with God's people. You know what we found out last summer when we put those um, maps out in the foyer? There's a map of Red Deer, and there was a map of Central Alberta, and we said, put a pin in there where you, where you live. You know what we found out? That most people that call Crossroads Church home come about once every five weeks. That's, that's not that good. We don't just want a crowd. We don't really just want your money. You know what we want? We want you to experience the presence of Jesus, and we want you to learn to worship him and allow him to speak into your life every week. Now, I I know there's times when we can't be here, but it's tough when the fellowship of God's people is just not a priority. And then we wonder why our relationships don't work and fall apart. Um, I learned a long time ago with my children that it would be important to put them where the Holy Spirit is most likely on a regular basis to speak into their lives. And that would be in the gathering of the Lord's people. You know, before you come here on Sunday mornings, this place has been prayed through. Do you know that? You know those people that come early and they pray for you? Sometimes they go bench by bench. You know that during the week, people pray that God's presence would fill this place and the children's area, every part of this place. That he would, actually, that God would stand guard, watch over this property. That he would hold back the evil one from taking good seed out of the hearts of your kids and my grandkids and us. I want to suggest to you that if we want to see marriage and family work, one of the things we have to do is take this whole idea of Christian community a whole lot more seriously. I just wanted to put that on the table because when you come to passages like that, We always have our questions. You know, why are the stats the same? That, I think, is one of the key reasons they're the same. Um, So let's let's, um, ask God to sort of give us a new vision of what doing marriage in community might look like in our world today. Let me then move on to Matthew 5, and I want to read you verses 33 down to about verse 37. It's the fourth time that Jesus has said, something to this effect. You've heard that it was said, but I'm going to say to you. That kind of a thought. Verse 33. Again, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it's God's throne, or by the earth, 
for it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. And then I'd like to just read James chapter 5 and verse 12. If you read through James, it won't be long if you're a careful reader before you recognize that James is just immersed and saturated in the Sermon on the Mount. And a lot of times he's just unpackaging, rephrasing the Sermon on the Mount for the people he's writing to. And in James 5, 12, he looks back at what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, the, the area I read to you, and he says, Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. Well, as I've said most weeks, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is painting a picture of what a follower of his looks like. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is his best, if I can put it this way, best shot at describing to you and to me what it means to be a follower of his. If you look back at chapter 4 and verse 17 and verse uh, 19, just before Jesus starts the Sermon on the Mount, verse 17, it says, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come. Repent means turn around. It means you're going this way, now turn around and go that way. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come. Verse 19, Come follow me, Jesus said, and I'll send you out to fish for people. The Sermon on the Mount, then, is what it looks like when somebody turns around. It's what it looks like when the kingdom of God breaks into a person's life. That's what it looks like. It looks like the healing of relationships, and Sean talked about that. And when the kingdom of God breaks in, you don't leave relationships hanging out there that need to be mended and brought back together. You deal with it. When the kingdom of God breaks in, there's purity of heart. When the kingdom of God breaks in, there's faithfulness in marriage. And now, Jesus tells us, when the kingdom breaks in, there's truthfulness in our speech. I know we're not perfect, and I know that we never bat a thousand, but we're talking here about the direction of a life. We're talking about the cry of a heart. Lord, I long to be pure. Lord, I long to be faithful. Lord, I long to be truthful in everything I say and do. If these things aren't happening in your life or in my life, there's really only two reasons. One, perhaps the kingdom has never broken in. Perhaps I've heard about Jesus, know him, have engaged with his followers, but maybe the kingdom of God has never broken into my heart, and that's why there's no healing of relationships or faithfulness in marriage or purity of heart or truthfulness in speech. The other reason might be that the Holy Spirit is grieved, that my heart has become so hard or calloused that he's grieved and he's actually withdrawn, as it were, his felt presence. That could be too. Well, at first reading, these verses seem straightforward. It doesn't seem that difficult to deal with what Jesus is saying here. And I, I breathed a sigh of relief, actually, after we got through the, the, um, the other bits and thought, now we're into some smoother waters. And yet, the more I studied these verses, the more I realized I was wrong. This is very much one of the harder parts of the Sermon on the Mount still. The significance, the importance of the verses I read to you is highlighted at the end by the introduction for the first time in the Sermon on the Mount of the evil one. Um, did you notice what Jesus says? He says, say simply yes or no, anything beyond this comes from the evil one, and when James uses it, paraphrases it, he ends his yes or no by saying, or you'll be condemned. So, um, clearly, what we're dealing with is highly significant and very important. Maybe it's one way of Jesus saying how easily we can let the evil one get a foothold in our life by words that aren't well spoken or well meant. I think if you could, in a sentence, maybe summarize Jesus' teaching at this point, in this paragraph, it would be this. When the kingdom of God 
breaks into a person's life, there's a birth of truthfulness and integrity. That would summarize what he's saying. When the kingdom of God breaks in, there's always a birth of faithfulness, integrity, truthfulness in someone's speech. In other words, his followers, they mean what they say, and they say what they mean. Now, I found for some of what Jesus is saying here, the easiest way for me to process it and try and understand it is just to throw some questions at the text. So if you don't mind, I'd like to do that with you again today. I think it's a helpful way of trying to unpackage what Jesus is saying. So the first question I put to this text is, what is the background? What's really going on here? What's behind the scenes, as it were, to these words? Well, Jesus is working with two of the Ten Commandments. He's working with the Third Commandment, and he's working with the Ninth Commandment. Both have to do with the misuse of our speech. Um, I want to read them to you. The Ten Commandments are in Exodus 20, and they're repeated in Deuteronomy 5. Let me read you these two commandments that Jesus is working with from Exodus 20. The third one is this, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name, or the traditional, the um, King James, don't take the Lord's name in vain. It actually means don't misuse it, and that's correctly translated by the NIV. And then the ninth commandment says this, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. One is dealing with how we speak. The other is dealing with what we say. Um, The third commandment is part of the first table. The commandments, the Ten Commandments, are in two tables. You remember when God said to Moses after he um, smashed them, he said, come up on the mountain and bring two stone tablets with you, and we'll do this again. And so there's two tablets. The 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 one has the first five that deal with our relationship with God. The second tablet has to do with our relationship with each other. So the first five commandments govern our relationship with God. The second five with each other. And uh, Jesus summarizes by saying, Love the Lord with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. And I wondered, I just wondered. I could never prove this. It's just something I wondered. If by taking a commandment from the first tablet and the second, and working with them here, if he isn't suggesting that integrity of speech is integral to the whole law. Well, that's the background that he's working with. The next question is, what is the, what's the presenting issue that Jesus is talking about here that he's speaking to in these verses? Well, he's talking about oaths that people take, or he says vows. You You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, don't break your oaths, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. Now, now the best way to look at it is to say here that vows and oaths in this verse are synonymous terms. Um, Better probably is to work with the word oath because um, vow might take us down the wrong path here for a moment. Uh, An oath is different than, say, a promise. A promise is what I make. A promise is what I do when I stand up in front of um, the minister and make my vows to Jenny. We call them vows. Those are promises um, or vows. But in the context that Jesus is speaking of, an oath is at a whole different level than that. What an oath is, is when you bring another authority in on your word. I swear by God. And then you say what you say. That's the oath. The oath is not just a promise, or as we would use the word vow in a wedding situation. An oath is up another level where you bring another authority, a higher authority, in on your statement, um, in on your word. That's what Jesus is thinking about here. But even, I think, a superficial reading of these verses indicates their intention. They they prohibit false oath-taking. Um, they, they prohibit making an oath and then breaking it. Now, what the Pharisees were doing, and this was the real issue, is they were, they were shifting the spotlight or the attention away from the oath itself and the need to keep it to the formula used in making it. So that the formula used in making the oath was more important than the oath itself. And they developed elaborate rules, actually, for um, making oaths, one of which was 
You don't need to be so particular about keeping an oath or a vow in, in which God's name had not been used. So if you're going to make an oath, um, use anything but God's name. Because if you don't use God's name, you can kind of wiggle your way out of it if you have to. And they went to ridiculous lengths to make oaths and have rules to kind of leave God's name out of it. For example, Jesus goes off on them in Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23, verse 16. He actually addresses this again. There he says, Woe to you blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by their oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gift on the altar is bound by that oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and every, everything on it. The point that Jesus is making there and in the Sermon on the Mount is this. However you try, you cannot avoid some reference to God. No matter what you say or however you try, you cannot avoid some reference to God, even if you do not use his name. He is everywhere and he is in everything. He fills heaven and earth. You can't get away from him. Even to swear by the hairs of your head is to remind yourself that you're not here of your own will. God made you, created you, brought you into being. He holds your life and your very breath in his hands. No matter how you try, you can't avoid God. The precise wording of the oath is irrelevant. A preoccupation with the formula was not the point of the law at, the, at all. The Pharisees, in other words, weren't experts in the law. They were experts at missing the point. What was the point of the law? What was the point of the commandments that Jesus is working with that they messed up? The point is simply this. Say what you mean and mean what you say. Speak truth and don't bring God's name in and associate it with something that's false. That was the point of the law. The whole problem, of course, then and now, is that our words can't be trusted. So we try and get people to believe our words by apply, uh, 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 appealing to some higher authority. That's the whole point of an oath. The problem with an oath is, it's really saying our words can't be trusted. And because you can't trust my words, I'll have to swear by God or swear on a Bible or swear some other way because you really can't trust my words, so I have to appeal to some higher power. And Jesus is saying, Christ followers have a new heart which leads to new speech and their words can be trusted because they live in a community that's headed up by a man called the truth who has given his followers the spirit of truth. You and I know that we live in a world of lies and broken promises. One of the great signs, I think, of a collapsing society is the amount of paperwork involved in even simple transactions so that we try and get everybody to keep their words. It's sad, really, isn't it? When Mr. Putin promises not to invade Ukraine, why should I believe him? Why should I believe him when he can't even keep his marriage vows and he lied about that and he walked away? Why should I believe leaders of the G7 when they tell me uh, they, and they make their great commitments when many of them can't even keep the vows that they made. That's the problem with the world that we live in. When you cannot keep your word, even at that level, you can't be trusted at any other level as well. Christ followers speak truth. They say what they mean, and they mean what they say. So that's what's going on, the presenting problem. What's the application of Jesus' words to us today? Well, first of all, the commandment's larger purpose should be honored. We need to get the point of what Jesus is saying here straight. Quite simply, what Jesus is doing in these verses is protecting speech in the community of the followers of Jesus. As in the previous commandments, he sought to protect sex. The trustworthiness of what we say is as important to the welfare of the community as our relationships in home and in the family and with one another. 
Discipleship, in other words, applies to our words as well as to our relationships. The, the incredible thing about the inbreaking of the kingdom of God when somebody turns around and begins to follow Jesus is that you find out that when you say Jesus is Lord, that applies to every part of your life. There's no part left out. We found out that it had to do with our relationships and with God and our marriage. Now our speech. In a few weeks after Easter, we'll find out that it has to do with our money and not just 10% of it, all of it, and what we do with it. It applies to absolutely everything in our life, this thing called discipleship. So that's the big point, I think, that Jesus is making here, that we ought to mean again what we say and say what we mean. Let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. Well, what are we to make about Jesus' teaching when he says this? Don't break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all. What are we to make of that statement? Do not swear an oath at all. Certain Christians have applied a very literalistic um, interpretation to that. Uh, for example, the Quakers. They, um, they're, um, and I don't mean Curtis, but uh, um, the, the group called Quakers they actually will not swear in a court of law because of what Jesus says here when he says, don't swear an oath at all. What are we to make of that? Well, um, I respect their opinion, but I, I'm not sure that they've got the right handle on it for a number of reasons. Number, number one would be, well, the rest of Scripture. One of, the, one of the things you ought to learn to do with Scripture is actually compare Scripture with cri Scripture. That's the best way to interpret it. Now, if I compare Scripture to Scripture, if I hear Jesus saying, um, don't swear an oath at all, and then I turn back, well, just a couple of examples, there's lots of them. Let me, let me turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 10. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, this clock is all cockeyed up here upside. Is it, is it 5 after, 10 after, 10? Is that close? Okay. Thanks. Somebody should fix this one day. That's just a little hint for someone in the middle of the ne next intermission to do that. But anyway. Um, Deuteronomy 10, verse 20 says, Fear the Lord your God and serve him. Listen to this. Hold fast to him and take your oaths in his name. How do I put that together with the servant on the mount? Um, or I come to um, something like um, Paul in Romans 1, 9 or 2 Corinthians 1 or 1 Thessalonians 2, where Paul on every occasion says, I call God as my witness. He brings God's name in to what he's saying. That's exactly what um, we're warned against here in the Sermon on the Mount. So how can Paul get away with it? Or I hear God himself, actually, in Genesis 22, swearing an oath to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 22, um, to Abraham, he says this in verse 16. He says, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you've done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I'll surely bless you and make your descendants numerous, and on and on it goes. And yet I hear Jesus saying, let your yes be yes, and your no, by no be no. And yet I hear God saying, I swear by myself. And then I think of Jesus himself. You remember in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus is before the court. He's in a court of law before Pilate. And... Um, he's questioned on that occasion. And it says, um, it says in verse 62, then the, or 63, the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. Then the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath. By the living God, tell us if you're the Messiah, the Son of God. Then Jesus said, you said so. But I tell you and all of you, from now on, you'll see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the throne. So on. What's happening there? He's remaining silent until the oath is brought in. And then under oath, he speaks. And I say, how do you put that together with Matthew 5, where Jesus says, don't swear an oath at all? You see, it's not quite as easy to untangle sometimes as you might think it is. My conclusion on it is this. What Jesus is talking about in the Sermon on the Mount is everyday speech, everyday conversation among Christ's followers, not speech, for example, in a court of law. 
the oath in everyday speech should never be necessary for a believer in Jesus. You should never have to say, I swear by, or I, I, um, I, I, in, in the name of, our speech should be enough. Your yes should be yes, and your no should be no. If on occasion I'm brought before a higher power and asked to swear on the Bible or something else, I follow Jesus in that example in the court of law that he was in. That's how I understand those verses to work. But you know, I, I, want to, um, I want to take a few minutes and just push it a little bit deeper, if I can, um, into our lives. Because one thing to sort of unpackage and understand what Jesus is saying, the, the other issue is, so how is this supposed to affect my life? Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, if you remember the third commandment and the ninth, let me take them from there. In the third commandment, we're warned about how we speak. In other words, don't bring the Lord's name into something that um, could cause his name to be misused. Um, don't pull his name into something not true or when you don't need to. And I've often thought about this situation. Somebody comes up to you and they say, the Lord told me to tell you what's happening there. You're pulling the Lord's name into that conversation. The Holy Spirit said to me this for you. I think we need to be very, very careful with statements like that. Why? Well, simply because we all know in part, Scripture says, and we prophesy in part, nobody bats a thousand. As soon as I say, the Lord told me to tell you, um, I'm putting myself on a very slippery slope. Sometimes I think Jesus up in heaven is going, oh, really? I mean, how many times have you heard somebody say that to you? God said to me, why do we do that? Why can't we just say, I have a word for you? Why do we pull God into that? Because we want people to know we've been in the presence of God. We'll know you've been in his presence without you telling us if you've really been in his presence. It's better to say, I have a word for you, than to drag God's name into something that may not be true or may not be completely true. When you have a word for someone, you give it, and you let them take that word before the Father and separate the wheat from the chaff. That's what you do. I think that's one area where it's easy to not let your yes be yes, you know, and drag God's name into something that sometimes I think he's quite embarrassed about, actually. Um, second thing is this. When it comes to our marriage vows, this concerns the ninth tablet, uh, or the, the ninth uh, commandment, the second tablet, which has to do with meaning what you say. Um, I, I've said this so many times up here that I, I, I'm almost embarrassed to say it again, but you know what the wedding vows are. Um, you tend to write your own. I, that's fine. The best are always the traditional ones that came from the Anglican, I think, Book of Common Prayer, but the, the, the vows were, I take you to be my wedded wife, husband. For better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. What are those? Those are reality statements that you're making. You're saying, I'll be there when the marriage is for worse. You're saying, I'll be there when it's in sickness. You're saying, you can count on me when the marriage is for poor. I, I, I will still be there. The language of wedding vows is not I'll try, it's I will. It's not for as long as we both shall love, it's for as long as we both shall live. It is actually an unconditional giving of yourself to your partner. It's not a, if you do this, I'll do that. That's contract, and a lot of marriages are based on what you'd only call a contractual relationship, not covenant. The articulation of the marriage vows is the establishment of a covenant between two people in the presence of witnesses and in the presence of God. God says, I witness those vows. That's not meant to be a foreboding statement from God. I witnessed your vows. It's meant to give you a sense of great hope. He was there. He witnessed them. He established the covenant. He's for us. We could appeal to him at any time for wisdom, understanding, knowledge in order to fill these vows and keep them the way they ought to be kept. The vows, when a couple says them and means them, they give you, in one word, security. 
Security when the marriage is for worse so that you can still put the tough issues on the table and work them through. Security when you're in sickness. Security. A secure environment to raise a family. That's what the vows are meant to do. And you ought to renew them from time to time because they're like renewing your commitment to the Lord. Every time you renew them, you say, I still mean today what I meant back then. And it always strengthens a relationship. So when Jesus says, let your yes be yes, and you know might be no, it's hard not to go there first. The most important words that you will ever speak after saying Jesus is Lord are the vows, the promises that we make to each other in a marriage relationship. Um, I think these verses go right back to what Jesus just said previously in the Sermon on the Mount. So let me, let me finish by just asking a simple question. How are we to live in this radical way? I mean, the whole sermon's radical, Sermon on the Mount, but it, it's radical to speak truth in a world where everything is hedged and exaggerated and, well, I didn't really mean that, and vows and promises are broken all the time. So how do I live radically in such a way that if you talk to me, you get truth? And I ask you a question, I get truth. How do we do that? Just two thoughts. One would be this. I think it begins with a confession. I think it just begins with a confession that the power of the lie is very strong in my heart. I think it begins like Adrian Rogers on the ground, like Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, who recognizing the truth of God's word and recognizing his heart throws himself down before God and says, woe is me, I'm ruined. I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. That's a beautiful confession of our true state. Every change begins with an honest confession of where we're really at. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. It's only the power of what Jesus did on the cross that provides cleansing and forgiveness deep down at the core of a person's being. It's when you ask that the blood of Jesus would cleanse you from all of your sin and deceit and unrighteousness that real transformation can begin. It's when you confess that your heart has grown hard and callous, and it really doesn't matter that much what you say, and it doesn't matter to you that you don't keep your vows and promises. And then I think, secondly, you need to ask God for the Holy Spirit. Let me talk to you for a minute about this, and I know the clock's kind of getting away on me, but I don't care if you don't care. Um, do you know who the Holy Spirit is? How does Jesus change you? Most people think it's through rules or law, but that's never worked. Never worked in the Old Testament, won't work today. You can't just say to people, here, do this. He doesn't give us a bunch of rules. You know what he gives? He gives us a person. And he says, this person, the Holy Spirit, will teach you and instruct you and counsel you how to do life with me and with my people. If you've never heard of the Holy Spirit, you're going to be in a lot of trouble because you can't keep this stuff in your own effort. Any more than if I said to you, you never had a piano lesson in your life, come up here and try and play Amazing Grace. You could never do it. You'd never been trained, instructed. Um, the Holy Spirit is given by Jesus to you when you put your trust in Jesus Christ, when the kingdom breaks in. Your job and my job at this point is to get to know him to learn about him, to read what Jesus said about him in John 13, 14, 15, and 16, what Paul said about him in Ephesians chapter 4 and 5, and to ask Jesus to fill you with the Spirit and to open your ears so that you begin to hear him actually talking to you and telling you how to live life so that you learn every single morning to get up and draw on his power he can shape your heart. He can melt your heart. He can actually turn a heart again, the things that it needs to be turned to, that, it, that the heart is turned away from. But only the Holy Spirit changes people. Do you know who the Holy Spirit is? I would suggest to you that you ought to become passionate about getting to know him. Not for his own sake, because he'll put the spotlight on Jesus. 
but because you cannot do anything Jesus asked you to do without the enabling and empowering of the Holy Spirit of God. Does that make any sense to anybody? Um, I, I tell you what, I, I, I was here a few weeks back when we had a thousand people in here, wonderful people, but very, very legalistic. And they had all their rules. Even their cars were mostly all the same color. Their clothes were the same. Um, and I, 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 in some ways, I was drawn to that because then I would know what my riverbanks were. And yet I longed at the same time that they would know the freedom that comes from following Jesus, led by his Spirit, who is just like him. Jesus said, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send you somebody just like me. In other words, you will never have to do life alone. You don't have to do marriage alone. You don't have to do business alone. You don't have to do family alone. You don't have to do anything alone. You just have to keep in step with this person that I'm giving you to do life with. That's an incredible gift. Not just forgiveness of sins and eternal life, but the gift of God's presence in your life, in your home, in your marriage, in your family, in your workplace, in your school. There is nothing greater than that. Well, um, we're going to end by doing what I suggested that we would do, and that is I'd like you to hear this song. The group is going to come out, and here's what I want you to do. Please follow me on this. Um, we won't shoot you if you don't, but um, I would like you as much as possible to stay just two times through this song. The first time, I would like us just to sit. Is that okay? Because uh, I want the words to wash over you. I want you to hear the words. Before you start singing them, I want you to hear them. And I want you to understand them. And then hearing them, the second time, Ken will ask us to stand, and we can sing with the band. And, and I'd love you to make this your prayer, because it is the place where transformation begins. Lord, make me broken. Lord, make me empty. If you mean it, if your yes is yes and your no is no, then I'll tell you what, Jesus will run to help answer this prayer. So let me just pray that God would open our ears to hear and our hearts to believe and that we could respond the right way. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are the same and your heart and your thoughts are the same as they were when Jesus was here. We thank you that you've actually given us your own personal presence, the Holy Spirit, in order that after having turned around we can begin to follow Jesus day after day. I pray that you would open our ears to hear the words of this song and our hearts to believe, our minds to understand, and to respond appropriately in Jesus' name. Amen.